Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Anomaly Sea Ice Challenge with the transhumanist paragons of Pandroth. Last time we left off, after surviving a siege from Waster Pirates, we suffered our fair share of injuries, which we are currently treating, however, we also took three prisoners. And not only that, our anomaly containment cell has also gotten a bit more populated, as we were able to capture a ghoul named Gracie. And this is indeed a lovely segue into announcing that the Live Love Provoke the Void design by our very own Gracie is now officially available in the Pete Complete shop. That shop has also moved back to T-Mill, more on that in the next channel update video, but I think you'll find your way around the site just fine. Just very briefly, T-Mill is a print-on-demand store solution focusing on sustainable products, more so than any other of these services that I know of, and I think you will soon discover that the overall look and feel of the shop are also much nicer than what we previously had. Very fittingly then, T-Mill also offers free shipping this weekend, albeit only on UK orders. For Europe and the rest of the world, free shipping is tied to a minimum order value. Now, I know that a large number of you live in the United States, and admittedly, T-Mill's shipping costs to the US and other non-European countries are not exactly cheap. However, if you still want to grab some merch to support me, then might I interest you in the Patreon merch tier. With your pledge in that tier, you'll be able to select any item from the store and I'll send it over to you, completely on me. For the non-European audience, this might in some cases be the more economical solution. In any case, all of that just to let you know that Gracie's design is now available, so visit shop.peatcomplete.com or check out the links in the description and the comments down below. And with that, let's get back to the gameplay, as Ellie now begins converting one of our more interesting prisoners, Maniac suffers a corpse obsession mental break, and of course you already know which corpse he is going to present to the world, his very own, more or less. Interestingly enough, it was that very corpse that caused him to suffer the mental break in the first place, thanks to our small lifter bot Rico though, it's quickly back where it belongs. At this point then, let's also make a quick change to our anomaly research plans. Let's stop researching advanced psychic rituals for the moment and put all of our efforts into ghoul infusion. This now makes it so that both basic and advanced study progress will contribute to this project, which we do want to unlock as fast as we can. However, we will definitely not be able to unlock it fast enough to save our prisoner ditch here, although to be honest, the infection here does not really change anything about their fate. Judging from the comments of the last episode, most of you were in agreement that we should not want to keep them around. So Vulik is now going to extract a hemogen pack, then blood feed on them for good measure, and afterwards we will execute them by extracting the heart. That's a procedure though that has a chance to fail, so that's why we are installing the light here. And so we gain a heart and lose one mouth to feed. A heart that we did of course not just extract because we are cruel, but much more so because we have a genie prisoner here that we would like to recruit, however she is currently suffering from an artery blockage. And just a quick reminder of why we want to recruit her, a level 19 crafter who's also good at shooting and intellectual work should fit right in, it will be some time though until we can make that happen. At least in terms of conversion however, progress should be quick, Nazim here definitely not the most charismatic fellow we have, but as is the case with all genies, she is a wimp and therefore able to be easily swayed. As Ellie then begins making more chem fuel, Maniac finally snaps out of his corpse obsession, and that means we can now assemble the full size of our colony to have a conversion ritual for our genie. Chances are we'll get at least one development point out of this, maybe even more. And indeed, one point is added as a result of an effective conversion ritual. We also receive a small mood bonus for everyone and can see that our target is much closer to becoming the sixth member of the Paragons of Pandroth, although recruiting her will most likely be another matter entirely. A few hours later then, we once again expand our base a bit, you can clearly see that things are getting a bit crowded inside. Not to mention that we will also need to expand our rice production soon, now that we also have to feed what are currently still two prisoners. And so, with this upgrade here, we now acquire a bit more space. Space that we will once again fill with simple concrete, just to make it look a tad bit nicer. And just in that moment, we have an exotic goods trader pass by. Now this one, a proper caravan, and outside temperatures have also increased a bit. 
so I'm hoping that they will stick around for a while. At the very least, they make it over to our base before deciding to leave again, so let's sell them some plasteel and four elephant tusks. The plasteel obviously something we are not willingly parting ways with, but necessary in order to purchase both a bionic arm and the almanac of shadows here. The first book to make an appearance in this series, and this one is special. For every hour reading it, we will make a bit of progress towards two anomaly research projects. However, at the same time, there is also a small risk that reading the book causes a mental breakdown, which is unique to these anomaly tomes. As we rearrange our facilities then, we make room for more hydroponics basins. The idea here is obviously to get a full setup going in the not too distant future. Eventually, we should be able to turn extra rice into camp fuel to then turn back into power. And yes, it is entirely possible to break various laws of physics with this. We'll have to see whether or not that's a path we'll go down. For now, with the lights turned back on, you can already roughly see what the plan is. We will obviously not expand to that number of hydroponics basins immediately, but we should already make sure that we don't block the space. And so the day progresses until we reach a very important milestone. Nazim has successfully finished his study of the unnatural corpse of Maniac, meaning that we can now safely destroy it to recover a shard. However, doing so would also mean that we can no longer study it to gain research points, so we're going to keep doing that for a little while longer. After all, we want to unlock ghouls as fast as we can. Unfortunately though, it looks like the time to destroy the corpse has already come after all. This message right here warning us that the corpse is growing rapidly stronger, and the game could not be more clear about what this means. So let's destroy the corpse with Nazim here before something awful happens. At this stage of our colony, we definitely do not want to wait and find out what that is. And so, in a violent, gory explosion, Maniac's doppelganger vanishes. So no more mood penalty for our oldest colonist, and we also gain a shard on top of it. Just a few seconds later then, good news from the prison. Nazim has successfully converted our genie, and that means we earn ourselves ideology development point number 5. However, at this point, the real treat will be recruiting her, as she is officially classified as a waster boss, and thus comes with a resistance of 23. This, I think, will take some time to get through. Meanwhile, we are making use of Maniac's level 8 plant skill to plant some heal root. Our food supply definitely not completely stable at the moment, but it should be enough, at least for our 5 colonists. So let's get some medicine going. On this difficulty, it's always good to have. In the evening then, we fuel up a drop pod and tell Ellie and Vulik to get inside. It is time to explore another ancient complex. And we only bring some medicine as well as components and camp fuel for the return trip, and so it only takes a few minutes until we're ready to launch. For a change, our two explorers then land right next to the ancient structure. The tile here also officially polluted, but we will most likely not stay long enough for that to have any meaningful impact. The first room then immediately greeting us with two mechs as well as with a chest of loot, so eventually we will have to come through here, but at least for now let's crack open a different way inside. This then revealing another chest, and after a bit more exploration we also come across an ancient crypto sleep casket, and whoever's inside will most likely not be friendly. The rest of the place then nothing out of the ordinary, a few more crates and a supply console, and eventually one more enemy in the form of a mega spider. Now this also means that we potentially have three separate factions that we could pit against each other, so let's get all of those rooms opened from the outside. First we clear the exit for the mega spider, which just keeps sleeping though. Up next then we clear a line of fire towards that unstable fuel node, and finally we ensure that whoever's in that crypto sleep casket can get out too. At this point then, we will have Ellie shoot the unstable fuel node while Vulek targets the crypto sleep casket. This will shortly reveal its inhabitant, and that also means that it's high time for us to get out of dodge. And indeed, the ancient survivor here does not seem to be amused. In a few short seconds meanwhile, they will have mechanoids coming at them from behind. While we get very lucky here not to get hit ourselves, our enemy here using the new Hellcat rifle introduced in Anomaly, and as you can see, it does have a long-range flamethrower built in. 
Nonetheless, they go down without too much resistance, but crucially buy us a bit of valuable time. Time that we can use to hopefully clear out both mechs here before they can target us. The first mech was another flamethrower-wielding Scorcher, thankfully already down. With Volek being a Sangophage, we have to be a bit careful with enemies like this. The other mech meanwhile, just a militer with a mini shotgun, already hit once or twice and therefore easy to outrun, so hopefully not much of a threat either. And there we go, enemy down. Unfortunately though, the real fight is just getting started. With only Maniac, Nazim and Young Elpis to protect our CI's home base, we are now getting attacked. In total, we will have three groups of troubles to contend with, although they will thankfully all prepare for a while before coming after us. And this gives us at least a brief moment here to clear out the ancient complex. The Mega Spider here, our last enemy, at least until we activate that supply satellite, which I actually think we want to do, otherwise we came here for nothing. Back home meanwhile, we are sending Nazim and Maniac out to meet one of the enemy groups. Our loot from the ancient complex then, two advanced components, as well as a bit of chem fuel and plasteel. As Ali then opens the last crate to recover even more plasteel, Volek finishes hacking the satellite. And so we have a small supply drop coming in, this one consisting of 55 units of alpaca wool. That's obviously not a lot, but enough to make two tukes out of it. And while we now already begin disassembling the ruins for steel, we are then attacked once more, this time by pirates attracted by the drop pot. Being mostly melee enemies, however, I think we should be easily able to take them. In the meantime, Nazim and Maniac have begun engaging the first enemies. And with one archer dead, their two compatriots will now begin their attack prematurely. At least, that is what I thought. Unfortunately, just a few seconds later, we are informed that everyone else is now attacking too. So that means an additional nine enemies coming in from the south. Amidst all the chaos then, I completely forgot to check on Ellie and Volek, but they seem to have fended off their attackers with ease, so they can now go back to building their transport pod, while we try to achieve the same level of success back home. And well, in some aspects we are getting lucky here, after fending off the first group, the second one decides to go as well, however, sadly not before stealing some of our valuables. Nonetheless, compared to losing colonists, I think we can live with that. Now, there does remain a third group, and this is by far the largest one, and they do have a few ranged enemies among them, and with us not really all that well protected due to the cold, I think it's time to use that psychic shock lance. This at least gets rid of one archer, and we don't have that many more coming in. The rest just seems to be very content with grabbing whatever they can, including our very valuable thrombofur dusters, although I suppose we don't really need them out here on the sea ice anyway. Lifterbot Rico also making a very brave last stand, and with Volek off the map we unfortunately also can't command it to do anything else, and so Rico quickly goes down. Now the fight is far from over yet, we are of course still pursuing anyone who stands in our way, and very importantly that includes the last of the enemies here who is trying to steal our bionic arm, Another one already carried away the heart that we harvested earlier. This arm meanwhile a bit more precious than that I think. Finding another heart should not be too difficult, considering that not all of the enemies on the map are already dead. That arm however we paid a pretty penny for, which is why I am very relieved to see Maniac deal the killing blow here, just moments before the enemy makes it off the map. And so, while we may have lost some valuable items, we did not lose any colonists, and we can even capture another prisoner. And while Nazim ensures that they don't die too early, Vulek and Ellie are ready to head back home. Unfortunately, we will have to leave behind all of that plus steel. With two people squeezing into the same pot, we don't really have that much spare capacity, and I consider the other items here to be a bit more useful. And so, our five colonists all survive the adventures of the night. Vulek can quickly get Rico patched back up again, and afterwards we thankfully do not have that much cleanup work to do. Our recently captured prisoner meanwhile sporting the tough trade, and considering what we are currently researching, this could be of interest, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In the evening we can watch Volek turn that alpaca wool into two tukes, and being of excellent quality they also provide excellent cold insulation, so a short while later we see both Ellie and Volek sporting one. The night then brings with it another small base expansion, 
The reason for this, quite simple actually, we are about to have ourselves a guest soon, and for a change, they will not occupy our prison. Nonetheless, as we have chunks of spacecraft falling down once more, our prison is what we focus on next. As I have mentioned before, recruiting that genie could become a bit of a lengthy endeavor, so let's make sure that we give her a cell that is at least as nice as we can afford at the moment. That in turn will raise her mood, and higher mood means easier recruitment. And speaking of recruitment, at least for the next seven days, we will now also house a member of the Empire. We are accepting this quest here in exchange for silver and glitter world medicine. The pawn that was on offer, unfortunately, not really a great addition. Our Imperial guest, meanwhile, will certainly be a handful. Not only will she not do any work, but possessing both the ugly and creepy breathing traits, she might get on the other's nerves. And those others might be more than just our colonists. Yes, it seems like just opening that anomaly book we purchased earlier has sent her into a sadistic rage, and she is now going to let it out on that tough prisoner we just captured. And it looks like she is literally beating the belief out of him. The beatdown is answered with a crisis of faith, which ironically is actually beneficial for us, now making it easier to convert him and to obtain another ideology development point. Our guest's rage then coming to an end, but that does not mean that she stops punching prisoners right away. In fact, she now has both of them on her heels, while Vulek does the only sensible thing, and that's to get out of there. Eventually then, it looks like everyone has calmed down a bit and we can get to treating our patients. I have to say though, the Empire not really making a great impression here. A short moment later then, Vulek finishes the construction of a jade column just to hold up the roof and to provide our room with a bit more beauty. Our barracks are now already considered somewhat impressive, so slowly but steadily we are building ourselves a nice little home out on the sea ice. Our genie prisoner meanwhile getting herself a peg lag installed to replace the one that she lost. And not only is that better than no lag, it actually also helps her mood. Keep in mind that she has recently converted to our transhumanist ideology. And apparently even a peg lag counts as pushing the boundaries of humanity. Lifterbot Rico then reinstalling our deep drill for what is likely the last time, at least inside of this base here. We have a few hundred units of steel still left underground but afterwards the vein will be exhausted. Nonetheless, at least for now, we still have more coming in, so let us perform another void provocation. And as always, Elpis will be the one to do it. Let's see what he calls upon this time. And while that ritual is being performed, Nazim converts our tough prisoner to the Paragons of Pandroth too. However, he will most likely not join us, at least not as a fully-fledged colonist. The Void Provocation then ends, as it usually does, with Elpis falling into a short psychic coma, and so we can now once again wait anxiously for whatever we have coming our way. In the meantime, Ellie, who has actually built a bit of a relationship with her, works on recruiting our genie, as we now also have visitors coming in, potentially at the worst possible moment. That of course depends heavily on whatever entity is about to appear. Interestingly enough though, after several hours there is still no sign of anything, which is certainly not a relief, but perhaps even cause for greater concern. Either way, let us trade before anything messes up our plans. We're just going to sell a few old clothing items here to grab whatever silver the trader has left. Several hours later then, and still nothing has happened, Vulek has also ventured halfway across the map to deconstruct that ship chunk, and even with the sun setting across the sea ice, our colony is still standing. In the middle of the night then, another lone visitor passes by, but this one can hardly be called an entity, and a few moments later they are also already gone again. So whatever we may have on the map has not yet shown itself, that is, if it's there in the first place. However, with the game now telling us that we can use the draw animals ritual again, let's do exactly that. And even though the psychic sensitivity of the invoker does have an impact, it is incredibly small, which means the role once again goes to Elpis for another roughly 50-50 shot at drawing manhunters or regular animals. And while the ritual is underway, we then also receive another quest. Let me know if you think we should take this one. It would mean lending a colonist to the Empire for seven days. 
In exchange, we could get some more medicine, another nerve spiker or a book and a gene pack. And I have to admit, very happy here might not be the worst thing in the world, especially not for Ellie, who does still have a bit of a mood problem. And the events don't stop coming, this time we have a combat supplier caravan appear. They too, however, do not seem like an entity to me. And so we conclude another draw animals ritual, and with success. By the way, I am always dearly hoping that we do not get polar bears from one of these rituals. Considering that we still have the fundraiser for Polar Bears International going on, this would put us in a bit of a dilemma. So perhaps we can refrain from killing polar bears on screen while we try to help them in the real world. Either way, for this round of psychically drawn in animals, we have muffalos. And apart from maybe the mega sloth, that is about the best thing that can happen. Trading wise, meanwhile, we don't really get lucky. Having all of our valuables stolen or sold already, we are not really left with much. And so the caravan here will be sent away empty handed. The muffalo hunt then a few moments later, a smooth operation. Maniac's legendary quality sniper rifle once again proving its worth, while Nazim's nerve spiker holds the animals in position for just a little bit longer. And so in the evening, Ellie, who has actually become friends with our genie prisoner, successfully converts the one with the jogger trade, and that now brings our total up to 7 ideology development points. Three more, and the Paragons of Pandroth are already good for their first reform. Now, in case you're wondering, what we are building on the right side of our base here is just a conduit leading down to that plasteel vein we discovered last episode. It looks to me like in a short while we will be able to move our deep drill, and constructing such a long line of conduits here is in fact still cheaper than constructing a second battery. Vulik, by the way, has already begun death resting again. I actually wanted to complete the Void Provocation ritual before he had to, but it seems like that did not entirely work out. To make up for it though, we have now completed the Ghoul Infusion research, and so I would say our prisoner's days are very much numbered. And let me know what you would like to see us research next here. We could continue with some of what we have started, or alternatively look into something entirely new. Now, just as a reminder, we have two prisoners here, one with the tough and one with the jogger trait. Both of those traits would make for excellent ghouls, as you can probably imagine. The only issue is that we cannot turn them into one right away, as the procedure requires a medical skill of four, and Svulik is the only one who meets that criteria, and he is still death resting for another two days. So, we are going to have ourselves some ghouls to protect our home very soon. For today though, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut. Now, as we head for the outro here, we once again have some fan art, but this week it's special. Not only has Gracie, the artist behind the Live Love Provoke the Void design, graced us with another piece, this week we also have some music that I would like you to be able to listen to in its entirety, which is why I will shut up now, say thank you to the lovely artists, and hope that you enjoyed this week's episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.